Hey everybody, Jesus in the book of Revelation has been our study. And in this five part series, we're going to wrap it up by looking at the structure of Revelation, even in how the book is built and designed. It lets us know that it's a special gift to us to reveal Christ to us. Our focus verse for the week has been Revelation 3. And in verse 21, it reads that to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. This is the kind of love that you have for us, Lord. Not it's it's not enough that you just want us to be in the castle or to stand in the presence of royalty. You're even inviting us to sit in your throne. Lord Jesus, help us to believe in your name. Amen. When you take a look at Revelation and, and you step back and see the book, there's something that you see that it has in common with another prophetic book, Daniel. Daniel being in the Old Testament, Revelation being in the New Testament. And what you'll see is that these prophetic books are both historical and eschatological. Now, historical is simply a way of saying it, it, they hearken back or they refer to history. In fact, they are historical books and they have historical information. But then you have that word eschatology. And when you say eschatology, that simply is the study or the knowledge of things to come or as they relate to the second coming. So this future looking part of Revelation and this backward looking part of Revelation gives it a special impact on our understanding of Christ. Because, for example, when you look at a book like Daniel in Daniel chapter one and verses one and two, here is an example of the historical content of the prophetic books. It says literally that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. So this is a reference to uh, Daniel and eventually before they are taken off to what is happening. When did it happen? Well, it happened in the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim, who was the king of Judah. Babylon came and invaded. And sure enough, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God. Here we have historical information. This is the value of scripture, not just in terms of its spiritual impact, but it references history to assure us that it's a valid book. This is not a storybook. It's not a book of allegories. It's not a comic book. This is actual history, and it's written for our benefit. So that's one aspect of prophecy that you'll see in historical books. But then you have um, eschatological references or references to the future and as they relate to Jesus's return. For example, in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, it says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. Now this is Daniel again interpreting the dream of the statue, this composite statue that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of in here in chapter 2. He says that the kingdom shall, this is future tense, shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. These are references to things in the future. So prophetic books do both that. They hearken back to the past and they point to the future. Because when you check verse 45, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass and the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. This is what the book of Daniel does. This is what the book of Revelation does. This is God's way of letting us know what is to come to pass. That's eschatology. What's going to happen? The book gives us that assurance. In fact, it gave Nebuchadnezzar assurance that this dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. That is why we are so blessed to have these gifts given to us. And you have examples even here in Revelation 12, where in a single section of verses, you can have both history and eschatology, both past and future. Because it says here, the great dragon was cast out. That's a reference to something that's happened past. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. This is serious history. No one else was around at this point. This is information that was given to us and revealed by God himself. And now by the time you get down to verse 10, I heard a loud voice in saying, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren, that Satan, is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And now in the next verse, we get some eschatology 
future information because it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto the death. This is speaking of the faithful who in the future will not be overcome by the devil or Satan or his angels, but they will overcome him by the blood of the lamb. This is spoken of not just of those who in the ages to come before or after this, uh, this actually happened in Revelation 12, but even to us today, that there will be those who will surrender to the blood of the lamb and they will by the word of their testimony, not even love their lives to death. Even if it means death before dishonor, they will choose that before dishonoring God. They're going to be faithful ones, overcomers. And this is what we see here, both historically and eschatologically in Revelation chapter 12. So when you see that this book is able to take us future, past, present, it's a powerful tool. It is subject to misinterpretation. And one of the reasons why it's so attractive to be misinterpreted is because it's hard to understand. And there's something about us as humans. When we don't understand something, we just make it up. <laughs> and we'll just make it up in order to satisfy our pride and say that we've mastered that which we don't know. But the good news is, is that the book does not have to be confusing and it's not intended to be confusing. It is intended to be for believers. It is intended to be directed towards the saints, for they are the ones that are addressed in those first three chapters, chapters two and three. And it's intended to be a weapon against the accuser of the brethren. And that is why it's a special object of derision and confusion and rejection by Satan, because unlike any other book, it exposes for him for the liar that he is. And it also it exposes Jesus for the lover that he is. So when you think of the second point on the structure of Revelation, remember, Old Testament and New Testament are connected as First Testament and Last Testament. This is important because what you're going to see in Revelation echoes what we see in Daniel. So what you have here is the New Testament interpreting oftentimes what was introduced in the Old Testament. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10 and look at it this way. Moreover, brethren, in this connection between the Old and New Testament, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. This is Paul going back now. He's looking at history. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat, did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. And this is the beautiful point. We, we talked about this earlier, about how Jesus alone is the foundation of the church. No man, no leader, no pope, no Peter, Christ alone. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So now what's happening here? Paul is using Old Testament reality, history and theology to explain New Testament gospel. This is why the two go hand in hand. You do not get rid of one. You need the other to understand the other. And here is what he's doing here in 1 Corinthians 10. And he just says, point blank, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lust. This is a book that's designed to take historical fact. This happened. Then it takes people in the second phase or in the New Testament who then point back to what happened and said, you see what they did? Now watch it being repeated here. Now if you see it being repeated in here, make sure you don't make the same mistake. It's given as an example book, the ultimate example book. Because remember, the first thing the devil will tell you about the Bible is that it's a bunch of lies. It was not true. But when you see it laid out and people practiced or even people broke it or people disobeyed it, and you see it coming to pass, it assures you, wait a minute, this is real. This is valid. This is true. Because by the time you get to verse 11, again, repetition, all these things happened unto them for examples, our example. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. It's an admonition and a warning. Remember how it was just saying in the previous verse, it was saying, look, don't make the same mistakes that they did. You can't let lust overcome you like it overcame then. Here's why. And in showing us these examples, it deepens the impression that what is being said is true. So when you understand Old and New Testament, really, they're not. It's not so much one is old or one is new. In fact, it's really as one is the first and one is the last. And when you say first and last, 
there's a union that's created as opposed to when we say something old and new. Well, when I think of old, I get rid of the old. The old is valid. It's it's not worth. And, and so I get rid of it because it's old. That's why I need the new. But the Bible is really a, a first and, and a first and a last testament that allows us to see there's a connection that we both benefit from. So think of it even this way, like the moon. When you see different phases of the moon, you don't say that that's even though we'll say the new moon uh, or we'll say the old moon. It's still the same moon. It's just phases of one entity. The Bible is the same way. There's the first phase and then there's the final phase. There's the, the first testament and the final testament. But revealing a single united message to us in both love and truth to God's people and even to the whole world for that matter. So when you look at the Bible as this oneness and as this unity, man, it's encouraging now because every story is valid. And in fact, every adventure is real and every salvation is possible because what the Lord has done in the past indicates what he will do in the future. For example, if you go back to Daniel 3, verse 27, where it says the princes, governors, captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their hair singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. This is, da this is not Daniel. This is Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those are the Hebrew names. Then you have Nebuchadnezzar speaking their Babylonian names. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That happened. So you know what that means? If it happened then, if God delivered them then, God can deliver us now. If you go back and look at a verse like in Daniel 1, where it says that after their 10-day their test, where Daniel and his brothers, they went vegan for 10 days and said, okay, we're going to go vegan for 10 days. You let those guys just roll with, you know, eat the, the McDonald's and the, the Wendy's, whatever the king is eating, go for it. At the 10 days, see how we look. At the end, the Bible says their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave these boys real food, <laughs> fruits, vegetables, nuts and grains. What we were made to eat from the very beginning. Guess what? If God blessed them then in Daniel one, he can bless us now. I'm not talking about no Daniel diet or Daniel fast. I'm talking about the holy diet, the divine diet that the Lord gave us to eat from the very beginning. This is his goal. And so if he did it, then he can do it now. If they did it, then we can eat it now. All of these things given for our examples. And finally, Daniel six. Can God do what he did before? Well, when he came to the den, king cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel in Daniel six. The king spake and said to Daniel, oh, Daniel, he's, he's screaming now down into the lion's den. Servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Lions, lions. He's checking to see, you know, did the lions have lunch or did they declare a fast? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, <laughs> live forever because I'm alive. <laughs> My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. Now, now, Daniel's flesh was was fatter and fairer than everybody else in the old kingdom. <laughs> we just read that right in Daniel one. But even so, the lion said, no, 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 no. We're going to be vegetarians tonight because that angel standing up there is telling us do not touch. And we don't have a mind to, to reason or conscience to think. But we know enough that if God says don't, don't. And those lions didn't. Because Daniel said, I do. Daniel decided to stand with the Lord. And guess what? For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, I have done no hurt. This is the kind of book that the Bible is. And these stories that were recorded, what Paul said for our example. The God that saved yesterday is the God who can save today. He's still pulling souls up out of the waters of sin. He's still saving lives and changing vantage points and altering perspectives and casting down demonic strongholds and just 
changing the way that we think, even changing the ways that we look because his desire now, his desire is that we all be saved. And this book is the ultimate testament to his love. I'm so glad that we can read this with full assurance through Jesus. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. This book has been given to us as his gift to reveal his love.